Hello, it's Keith here and welcome to another assembly programming tutorial. Now this is going to be the last one of the sound programming tutorials for a little while and we've done all of the fairly advanced systems up till now and we've kind of reached the bottom of the bow so to speak because we're going to be looking at what's known as the beeper speaker on the ZX Spectrum and the Apple. Now the ZX Spectrum Z80 and the Apple is 6502. So again we're going to be looking at two different processors. Now why am I saying that the beeper is fairly basic? Well unlike the other systems where we've got a sound chip that's doing the work for us, the Spectrum and the Apple II have no real sound chip that's going to do anything for us and we only have the most basic sound capabilities and we literally only have the ability to turn sound on or off. Well what do I mean by on or off? Well we're actually going to have to create the waveform ourselves by timing the processor and repeatedly flipping the sound chip to make a waveform. Now you've seen over the last videos, if you've been watching, we've seen various square waves and things and you, you can see the wave goes up and down and uh, if you've been paying attention, the um, taller the wave is, the louder and the wider, the lower frequency it is, so the lower the pitch. In the case of the beeper speaker, we just have one control that we can use to make the sound and we have to send various pulses using that one control to make our waveform. So you could kind of imagine if you look at this picture here, going up and down like this, and so we can build the sound, but we have to do it manually. And this is why I think even though the beeper is the most basic, and like most things with programming, the more basic it is, I think the more interesting it is to look at because you really learn how things work because you're forced to go back to basics and do things yourself. And so with this case, when I started looking at it, I couldn't fathom how to make a sound with just an on-off command. But, you know, it's not hard at all, and we're going to look at it today. So I say about this on-off command, well, how do we actually use it? Well, on the ZX Spectrum, we have a port called port FE. And what we can do is um, this port does various things. Firstly, it does the border, the color of the border, which is quite unusual. And we'll be using that for a little bit of an effect later. It also does the microphone, but bit four of that port does the sound. And by inverting that bit repeatedly, we can create our waveform, as you can see here. So this would be the first inversion, this would be the second inversion, this would be the third inversion, this would be and so on. So as I say, we can create a waveform via timed inversions of that bit. Now, that's fairly straightforward, made some sense, but the Apple is even stranger. To do this inversion on the Apple, what we do is we read from memory address C030. Now the 6502 has no out commands, so reading and writing to to memory addresses to access hardware isn't unusual to me. But what was very unusual is we're not writing to that port, we're just reading from it. And when I was looking at the source codes for using the, the Apple, I couldn't see at all what was doing the sound because I was expecting some kind of write command or something and there, there isn't one. It's a read command that is causing the blip. And unlike the ZX Spectrum, we don't have to do any kind of inversion because all we do is repeatedly read that and it will make the sound for us. So when we want to create a waveform, all we have to do is create a little loop that does nothing for a period of time, then do the, the flipping operation, another little pause of the same length, flipping operation, another pause, flipping operation, and repeat that a number of times to make a length of note. Now the disadvantage of this is unless we're very clever with interrupts, it's going to mean our processor is completely busy doing this job. So unlike other systems where we can make a note and do our game and then change the note and do our game and make some music that way, Unless we're very, very clever in this case, making sounds is going to completely pause the processor while the sounds are playing, but we can make sounds. So at least we've got something. So to change the tone, we just reduce the length of the pause and the tone will go up in pitch. We can't really change the volume easily because um, we've only got on off and off. We can't select the height, but um, that's not going to be too much of a problem. When it comes to making noise, all we need to do is skip some of the flips. If we skip a random set of the flips, then the note, the tone will still have the, have a pitch, but it will become, become rough and jagged, and that will give us a good noise effect with the pitches that we need for the Chibi Sound driver. If you've not been following up until now, what is Chibi Sound? Well, it's a little driver that I've been creating for all of the systems in my tutorials. It takes a, a single byte. That byte has six bits of a tone from low to high. It has a loud or a quiet, which won't work in these cases, because as I say, it's not easy to do, loud and quiet, or it has noise on and noise off, and that's the seventh bit doing noise. So we're going to simulate our noise on and our noise off. We're going to have to give up on the quiet volume, because I can't figure out how to do it. Maybe there's a way that's cleverer than I am, quite possibly. But we're going to be able to at least do our tones and our noise. So that's the principle out the way. So let's have a look at the code, and let's start to actually hear some sounds. So here's a very simple spectrum test here. So we're going to be looping around this area here, 
So we've got a tone here, which is 30,000 being loaded into BC. This is the bit that we're going to be flipping to make the sound. And this bit is actually the border because we're going to flip the border at the same time. It makes a nice little effect that allows us to see the tone, if that makes sense. And so we've got two loops here. Now, the first loop is a delay in between flipping the bits, and this will effectively set our pitch. And then the second loop, which is an infinite loop in this case, repeats the sound. Because if we just made this sound once, it would last a millisecond and we wouldn't hear it. So we need to repeat that sound a number of times. And of course, the number of times we want to repeat it will need to go up as the pitch gets higher because this loop will get smaller. So we did kind of need to do some balancing there. But in this case, it's an infinite loop, so it doesn't matter. Well, let's actually hear it in action then. So now all you can hear is a very slow click. Now, I've intentionally set this to a ridiculously low speed, but you can hopefully see the, um, the wave going up and down. And this is happening every time that this command is being called. So probably the first time it's going up, the second time it's going down or something like that. And so this is making that ticking sound. Now, the ticking sound isn't really a lot of use because it's not really a tone of any kind. I suppose it's, I suppose it's interesting at least, but let's change it from 30,000 to 3,000. That's changing that inner loop to a smaller number. And now you can hear we've got something that's more a more usable tone. And you can see the, the, the waveform here is starting to look a bit more like something we'd normally see. Okay, let's close that again. And let's change it to 1,000. Again, a much higher pitch now. And you can see our border is changing speed as well. So let's try a very high pitch now. Let's try 300. And now it's extremely high pitch. So again, you can see how just changing that inner loop, because remember the outer loop is an infinite loop, but reducing the length of that inner loop between these, these blips of the sound chip is increasing the pitch. Okay, so let's try something a little bit different. So now we've got a different version of the code, and what I've done here is I'm using the R register as a source of some pseudo-random data. And so I'm now using the R register, flipping it with H, which is the original 10001 mask, and then I'm setting all the other bits to zero. So we're going to be flipping the border and the sound bit together, depending on the R register's bits. And so let's listen to that. Now you can hear that the sound is a bit more rough and the waveform is more jagged. And that's not a very good source of random noise. But if we had a better random noise generator, the, the sound would become more distorted again. So by randomizing the time we flip the bits, but keeping the same frequency, we can make it into a noisy sound rather than a clear tone. So that's the principle. So let's have a look at Chibi Sound on the ZX Spectrum with the beeper speaker. And so here you can hear the rough sounds. And now these are the more pure tones. Now these are running very, very fast and the reason for that is that I've configured this for the Grimes Z80 program where I needed the sounds to be quite quick and not slow down the gameplay. But we can configure them to be any length we want accordingly. But as again, as I've said, it's important to note that the CPU is entirely busy while the sound is playing and the sound is not playing when the CPU is running whatever our code is. Of course, in this case, the, of course, in this case, the code is just showing the number of the tone. So there's not really any time that the sound isn't playing. Okay, so you've heard Chibi Sound on the ZX Spectrum. Let's have a look at the actual source code. So here's the Spectrum version of Chibi Sound. It's a bit more complex than the other versions. Firstly, we've got this special command called setZX, which allows us to turn off the border effect, because although it's nice to look at in this kind of demo mode, we don't want that during our gameplay. There's also a speed option, because as I've said, I needed it to be much faster for Grimes Z80 to be playable. So this is a bit of a ZX Spectrum special. It's not part of the normal Chibi Sound code. It's just because of the 48K. Now, Chibi Sound, as I've said before, will take a single byte. There's a noise bit. There's usually a volume bit, but it won't do anything on this version. And then there's six tone bits. If all the bits are zero, then we're muting the sound. In the case of the 48K, because we actually have to use our processor to make a sound, if there's no sound to be played, we just don't do anything. Very simple. 
Now we've got some self-modifying code here. This is the hexadecimal representation of LD A comma 00010001. So this is self-modifying code that would mean that and we're going to store that later if the noise is off. If the noise is on, then we need to change that and we're going to read in R instead. And R is the refresh register which constantly increments and that will give us a fairly noisy sound instead. Very simple way of getting random data on the Z80. So whatever our code is going to be, we then store it into the noise effect location, which we can see just here. And so we will be changing this either to the same as it currently is showing, or it will be loading from R instead, just depending on if the noise is on or not. Now what we need to do is we need to get our pitch and we need to convert it into a number of repeats. Now here we've got some code that is going to be self-modified and this is relating to the delay of the outer loop because as I've said before, the inner loop has to be the right length for the frequency we want but the outer loop is the length of the note and depending on and higher frequencies will need a longer outer loop for the tone to be played for the same amount of time so we're, we're having to sort of adjust our outer loop depending on the size of our inner loop to try and keep things consistent so at this point we've got the pitch we want to play so we're storing this with again with self-modifying code and we're just storing it into bc here and you can see this is the inner loop because it's waiting doing nothing and then this is the outer loop because we're looping back here to make the tone again. Now this is the code that actually does the tone work. So we've got our self-modifying code here which will either load in this constant value or load in the R register which is semi-random. Then we're flipping the bits that we used last time which we're storing in H. We're making sure that only the border and the sound bit are kept. We're then backing those up in H for the next occurrence of this loop and we're sending them to that port FE to make the sound if indeed these bits have been flipped. And that's really all there is to it. It's a bit of a pain but most of the code here is just working out what length the loop should be and then this extra bit of code here and all of this self-modifying code just to keep the code as small as possible and to get that noise effect in there. So it's a lot more complex than it needs to be but as I've said before you know you can always just drop back to this very basic sound example here and have a play with that if this is too complicated but hopefully this should just work for your needs anyway without any changes. So that's the spectrum out of the way. Well what about the 6502 based Apple II? Well let's take a look. I don't have an example of just making the sound on the Apple II because the principle is basically the same but as I've said before rather than writing to port FE we have no out commands so on the 6502 so we're not, certainly not doing that and what we're actually doing is we're actually reading from memory address C030 which has the same effect. Well let's hear Chibi sound in action then. So this is my Apple II emulation and here we've got the noise effect and the noise effect is actually better on the Apple II and that's just because I've done a better job coding it and I'll tell you why in just a moment. So these are the noisy tones and then when we get past C0 and then when we get past 8-0 you'll start to hear the pure tones. And now here you can hear the clear tones but I think that's enough of that. You, you know what tones sound like so um, we, we won't go through the rest of that. Well let's have a look at the actual source code. Now the 6502 is a very good processor but it does have a more limited command set than the Z80 and one of those limitations is we don't have the R register. So my, um, my plan of using the R register for noise, for random noise, wasn't going to work too well on the Apple II. So I've actually done something more advanced that ironically gives a better result. What I'm doing is I'm actually using the source code of my own program as a random data source. So I'm reading the first 255 bytes and looping around that 255 bytes and reading those instead of the R register. And they actually give better random noise because the R register isn't remotely random. It just keeps going up, gets to 63 and goes back to zero again. So I've actually got a better random noise source here in my source code. So once again, we're just checking here if we're at zero. If we are at zero, then we don't do anything. We're just jumping down to the return command here. If we're not at zero, then once again, we need to start doing some work. The first thing we're doing is we're flipping the bits of the tone. And then what we're doing is we're storing that into X. X is our outer loop, you see, here. And our inner loop is going to be done later on. We're doing some pushing and popping. So you can see X is used twice. 
the next thing we need to do is we need to, to get our noise source done. And you can see I'm using some virtual registers here. The um, 6502 doesn't have many registers. Uh, what it can do though is it can use the first 256 bytes of memory as the zero pages it's called. And I've named some of those as if they are Z80 registers which is probably blasphemies in some cult of 6502, but that's what I've done. So we're going to go into this a lot more in my 6502 tutorials next year, but for now, just bear with me a little bit on that. So we're storing our counters here, and then we're checking if the noise is set. If the noise is not set, then what we're doing is we're zeroing out our D register here, and because we're going to use D as a mask, and so we're effectively nullifying the effect of the noise we're going to be doing. Now what we need to do is we need to get our tone back and we're going to store that into Y here. And now we're going to get our noise value here and then we're going to and in D. Now D will either be zero if noise is off or 255 if it's on. So effectively we're reading a byte of our code in from HL and then we're either nullifying that or we're keeping it. So we're reading it in whether the noise is on or not but we're cancelling the effect if the noise is off. And then what we're doing is we're rotating one bit off the result and if the, that bit is a one, then we're going to um, skip the um, noise. And if it's a zero, we're going to make the noise. Now, of course, it is always going to be zero if our noise is turned off. Now, as I said before, to make the blips, what we have to do is we have to read in from CO30. So this is all of our sound code, literally speaking. Then we've got our inner loop here, which is the weight be between the tones. And this will effectively make the um, frequency. So the shorter this weight, the higher the frequency. And then we've got our outer loop here, which is the one that repeats the note for as long as we need. And of course, that was defined by this bit of work here. So we're kind of inverting it because the, the shorter the inner loop, the longer the outer loop needs to be to make the tone a kind of constant sound. So again, it's basically the same code. And really, the only complexity between the two here is because of the difference between the 6502 and the Z80. But it's all generally pretty straightforward. So there we go. We're going to be done now on sound for a little while. We're going to come back to it next year with the 68000 and the remaining 6502 systems. But at this time point, I think we've covered all of the sound effects of all of the systems we've been looking at so far. We're nowhere near done yet on the Z80 series, but we are going to look at some new stuff going forward. So what I'm planning to do next is we're going to start looking at memory mapping on all of the systems. While the Z80 is limited to reading and writing to 64 kilobytes, the vast majority of systems from the Spectrum 128K to the Game Boy with its 5 512k cartridges can bank switch in some way to get more memory into the system so that the Z80 can have a larger amount of memory to get to. Now the way that that works is very platform specific so we're going to be looking at that and we're also going to take advantage of that to look at how to detect how much memory is present in the system and also detect the nature of the system because systems like the Game Boy and the Game Boy Color are almost the same hardware and we can make our software detect which system we're looking at and work in a different way. So we're going to be doing that on the um, ZX Spectrum because there's different spectrums even or even among 128k systems. The Amstrad CPC and the CPC Plus are very different systems and uh, Chibi Akamas detects those two systems to work out whether the CPC Plus features should be turned on. We're going to be doing that on a lot of different systems and we're going to be looking at how to do our bank switching and detect our hardware so that we can make our game dynamically respond to the system it's running on. As I've said always Please like and subscribe to my channel if you like these videos because I've got a lot more of them coming, not just on the Z80. We're going to be looking at far more interesting things next year as well. Also, if you're a backer of mine on Patreon, there's a new series starting at the moment about how to reprogram the Chibi Akamas game and explaining how the code works and how you can make it do different things if you want to because Chibi Akamas is open source, so I totally endorse you messing with the code and making your own games and releasing them. And if you can manage it, go ahead and sell them for all I care. Um, if you're not a Patreon backer, though, don't worry, because the series is going to be released next year as well. It, I'm, all of my content I'm trying to make free to everyone because I really want people to enjoy the content and hopefully learn something from it. Anyway, thanks for watching today. I hope you've enjoyed it and goodbye.